Um, well, hello everyone, and it's wonderful to be back. Um, preaching in Lent often leads us to think of having a series of sermons. And uh, when I worked at St. Paul's Cathedral, we had such a series of uh, sermons, and it was called Heroes of Faith. And there was a nice, slightly predictable lineup of subjects. Um, I, for instance, chose Desmond Tutu and ended the sermon by playing a one minute recording of Tutu uncontrollably laughing. It said much more than anything I had about the hope of glory and was made even better by the fact that it was Tutu laughing with the Dalai Lama. And in between the laughs, you could hear Tutu saying, Oh no, stop it, stop it, we must look holy. The one person I was slightly shocked to see in the series chosen by one preacher was Dolly Parton. Yes, we heard a recording of her sing, and we also heard some of those choice quotes by her through the years. The most famous, of course, you know, it costs a lot of money to look this cheap. Although my favourite of hers is, people always ask me how long it takes to do my hair. I don't know. I'm never there. Well, that sermon took me back to some of Dolly's films. And in her 1984 comedy, Rhinestone, she says to her rather obnoxious manager, Freddie, Freddie, there are two kinds of people in the world and you ain't one of them. I want you to think about that comment of Dolly's as we progress through this short talk. There are two kinds of people in the world and you ain't one of them. There's something about us humans that loves to divide things into two, especially other humans. The poet Henry Cole said he divides the world into people who want to control something and those who want to make something. Nabokov divided the world into those who laugh and those who smile. Oscar Wilde thought that there are those who bring happiness wherever they go and those who bring happiness whenever they go. Most of us probably join in the game. Good people and bad people, right people and wrong people, fun people and boring people, people pulled by the future or people pushed by the past, and so on. This sort of division is particularly evident in one of the most poisonous and cruel arenas of social media, the ninth circle of Twitter, known as Anglican, where many appear to feel much better by pointing out the error of others not being of their own tribe. Christians can often be very attracted to the placing of everything into two clear camps, real believers and false believers, conservative and liberal, and so on. And as much as God keeps on going, making extraordinary diversity, we persist in making deadly division out of it, usually for our own reputational advantage. And yet, we all know, don't we, that if there are two types of people in the world, we ain't one of them. It's all a bit more complex, mysterious, richer, more riddling than us always being this or that. And spiritually, it cannot be the case. An either or world leaves no room for growth no room for holding together, no exploration, and certainly no creativity. A this or that world does not allow us to see what we do not see. Our glasses are always too steamed up with our own hot breath. And this leads me into taking us back to what many of us will all be doing very shortly, preaching in Lent. On Friday, I go into hospital for an angiogram. I'm not looking forward to it, 
but it seems uncomfortably symbolic of the beginning of Lent, an investigation into my heart. It's been said that the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. And part of the problem is that so often we are not wholly either A or B, this or that. So when it comes to faith, some days we are reverent and some days we are rebellious. Some days we have devotion, some days an overwhelming sense of dereliction. Some days God is all that matters. Other days I haven't a clue where he is. God is my all one day. Or another day, I don't give him a thought. Oh, to vex me, wrote John Donne. Contraries meet in one. Lent is a time set aside each year to take these inner contradictions of the human heart very seriously, to see what God might be creating in all this turmoil. After all, the commandment is to love your neighbour as yourself, not to hate your neighbour as yourself. Now, some of my friends have a slightly different view about sermons to me. Some of them tend to think a sermon should have an argument, a line of thought followed through to widen the understanding and hopefully life. And I can see in their own preaching how this can work magnificently well, but I tend to think it doesn't have to do that. I don't think a sermon needs to be a river flowing the channel of its thought to a logical conclusion. Instead of a river, I think a sermon can sometimes be a fountain, not something to sail down, but something to draw from. It can therefore sometimes be unsystematic, a collage, something rich, figurative, paradoxical, even ambiguous, from which to take crumbs. They may not fully satisfy you, but more importantly, perhaps, they will make you more hungry, more hungry for God, for discovery, for faith. Now, to follow what I was saying earlier, there are not just two types of preacher. We all try out different styles from time to time, I hope. But to pursue my idea of this fountain sermon, you can use art or poetry, as David was just saying, as part of the preaching, used because it can help some people who are more visual in their understanding or allow people into the sermon's exploration in ways that prosaic words alone can't sometimes allow. And if the picture or the poem is difficult, you know the sort of comment, I don't like that modern stuff, Vicar, my grandson could do better, then, well, that's fine too. Lots to think about afterwards. Difficulty is sometimes an important spiritual necessity. And the great thing about art is that even if we don't understand it, we sometimes sense that in some unignorable way, it still understands us. We can read a poem or place a picture in a sermon to bring into the church or space that part of us from which poetry and art comes. That's an important thing to do if we are interested in the worship of integrated people. John Donne said that preaching is the thunder that clears the air. I think he means a clap of thunder more than clap trap. There are many ways to help do this, and the preacher should always be on the lookout. So in the time left to me now, I thought I'd point us not to poetry, which I bang on about far too much, but to a painting, one painting, for Lent. A few years ago, there was a story in the papers um, about this painting. I hope we can get a little bigger. There we are. By the Flemish uh, Peter Bruegel the Elder. It's currently on display in Vienna's marvellous Kunsthistorisches Museum, 
but Krakow's National Museum claims that it's theirs and that it was stolen by the wife of the city's Nazi governor in 1939 during the occupation of Poland. The painting is called The Fight Between Carnival and Lent. It was painted in 1559 in Antwerp, such a creative part of Europe at the time, and at the height of the Protestant Reformation. It is a beautifully typical Bruegel painting. It's large, uh, physically a large painting. It's a very crowded canvas with nearly 200 men, women and children in late medieval dress depicted on it. And we find ourselves looking down from a rather privileged position with a tilted perspective, godlike, on this town square during a riotous festival. It's a fantastic documentary. So many small people in a large landscape and each given the same amount of attention, whether they're wealthy or whether they're begging, the detail shown to them is equal. Now, the painting can be looked at in two halves. On the right, we see a church with people leaving after prayer and being shriven. And then we can see them in the foreground. I'm going to show you a little bit more detail in a moment, but you can see in the foreground on the right, uh, these people who've come from the church are giving alms to the poor, feeding the hungry, helping those with disability, calling attention to their need, and then tending to the dying. On the left, you see a couple of pubs. Congregated around it are beer drinkers, gamblers, various saucy types. The vulnerable nearby to them are not noticed, including that solitary procession of lepers right at the back at the left. We'll see those a little later. The vulnerable, as I say, are not noticed. Uh, instead, you find a man who is vomiting out of a window and another is banging his head against a wall. All sounds a little bit like lockdown or life, perhaps. Take a look at this picture in your own time. It's uh, far too complex and riotous to look too carefully at now. See the, the meticulous detail of what they're all up to and note the different activities on the left from the right. And then look right in the foreground where we see two figures being pulled towards each other on floats. One is Carnival. So if we could have the next slide. There he is. Carnival looks like me on a Saturday night out in Cambridge. This fat figure armed with a meat spit and a pork pie helmet. You wondered how I was going to get pork pies into the title. There it is. Actually, it might actually be a bird pie because you can see two little legs sticking out of it. He's on a a barrel that's being pushed by a sledge. That's uh, how often floats in uh, carnivals were pushed in Antwerp on sledges. Uh, if you look at this man in his little red tights, his manhood is rather accentuated, implying a rather notable libido, perhaps. His feet are stuck in jugs and he's looking at us. He's waving. We are his drinking companions. And he's being followed by masked carousers, people in the carnival who of course adopt various personas, trying to be social whilst hidden behind their masks. That sounds familiar, perhaps. And the man in yellow, you see the symbolic color of deceit, uh, is pushing the float, though he looks rather weighed down by cups and a rather big bag of belongings. Uh, if you look around, uh, dice are being played in a couple of places, reminding us of the foot of the cross, maybe. And you can see there, uh, right at the bottom of the picture, playing cards are under Carnival's sledge. 
he's coasting along, as it were, on a world subject to chance. If you could see the background of painting, you'd see that on, on the left side, uh, behind uh, Carnival and uh, the other parts of the left side of the painting, uh, all the trees are stark and rather leafless. However, when you look to the right-hand side of the painting, the trees have buds and are awakening on the trees. And if to see them all better, a woman is busily cleaning her windows. Children are seen on the right-hand side with spinning tops and in the foreground, the other jouster who's coming towards this uh, fat man here is uh, Lady Lent. Lady Lent, rather gaunt, unshowy, dressed as a Franciscan nun with a beehive on her head. Uh, the beehive was a common symbol of the Catholic Church at the time. And her followers are not eating meat and uh, pork pies, they're eating pretzels and fish, the things that you eat during Lent. She has two herrings sitting on her baking uh, peel. And just behind her chair, you'll see uh, on her cart, she's not on a sled, she's on a little trolley, uh, you can see a whole um, pot of mussels. She's got a book <clears throat> and a, rose, a rosary. And is that rosemary that she's carrying for sprinkling holy water in her hand? And uh, she has some clerics, um, looks like a Dominican, uh, pulling her along. Behind her, people, you can't, you, you can see the feet of, of a woman who's drawing fresh water from a large well, which lies just behind her. And the children around Lady Lent um, aren't wearing grotesque masks. Instead, if you look very co closely, I'm not sure if we can get this at all any bigger, but uh, for instance, the little child that you see immediately behind uh, Lady Lent has an ash cross on her forehead. So they've been to church and you can see the ashes on their heads. Now, as well as looking at the painting uh, from left to right, you can also look at this picture as a horseshoe shape depicting time and seasons, because if you start in the top left, um, uh, thank you, if you start at the top left, you'll see right at the back bonfires burning. These were the bonfires that you burnt, uh, the, the sort of um, last year's clutter. You, you burnt them in the villages on the 1st of, of January. Uh, and then as you came down in a sort of horseshoe shape, you see the leper procession that took place traditionally on the Monday after Epiphany. Uh, if you keep coming down in a horseshoe on the left-hand side, you'll see some candles being held for candle mass. Then you hit Carnival uh, on his barrel and Lent on her trolley. And then you're going back up the horseshoe towards the church uh, and you'll see as I say, the trees have some buds for new life. So it can also be viewed uh, in a, um, a horseshoe shape depicting the seasons of the church. Now you can look at this picture as a binary world again. The indulgent, vice-ridden drunks on the left and the good, pious, restrained people on the right. But Bruegel was more elusive than that. He seems to say that we all have a side that is normally masked by our self-performance as serious adult people. So restraint itself is an act here, a disguise for the parts we prefer to be unseen. And it's very interesting that Bruegel had a friend who once said that he painted the things that can't be painted. And another said of him that he paints the contradictions of his own time. So the left-right divide of the painting, when you take a closer look, is not as clear-cut as we might like. In fact, things are quite blended. And then some take a look at this painting and they wonder whether it's a painting about the infinite performances that everybody is engaged in, sometimes in masks that eat into our faces, but sometimes using the masks of religion to hide parts of us we're afraid of. 
There isn't a sense that the pious here are perfect or not capable of playing their own games or slipping into hypocrisies. I mean, for instance, how many on the right-hand side are abiding by Jesus' Sermon on the Mount about prayer and almsgiving and fasting being in secret, for instance? The statues in church, uh, and you'll see those in a minute, are wrapped in Lenten array, making them invisible in their cloaks. But is that what religion can do to us all at times? Uh, one child in the painting is carrying a box of shoes for the poor, but he's very near to a man begging who has no feet. Good works don't always reach their goal, it seems. As C.S. Lewis said of someone he knew, she lived for others, and you could always tell the others by their hunted expression. On the left, a couple of plays are underway, but are we being made to ask, are the people on the right also involved in their own sort of play acting, or is this genuine love of God and neighbour? Is this satirising both the negligent and the careful, carnival and Lent, all the addictions of a human heart? That woman at the back, who we might well miss doing her spring cleaning and cleaning her windows, is she the real one we should all be imitating? A spiritual spring clean, involving a better look at ourselves and the games we all play, the cautions we collude in. So I'm just going to ask, yes, so here we are. You can see the woman uh, washing her window on her uh, ladder. You can see a man on the window ledge with a far view. Um, and you can see uh, some people doing a ring a ring of roses and next to the procession of lepers on the left there. Can we just have a look at the next couple of details? Here you can see some of those with uh, various disabilities. Um, again, just look at the, the, the detail being shown uh, here. And uh, the next one, please. Here you can see the arms being given to the poor on the right-hand side. Uh, you can see, I think, uh, someone who's died. They've probably been washing the body, preparing for burial. Uh, and you can see, uh, again, a sort of wealthy burger type at the top of the painting, uh, giving out uh, uh, money. Um, again, the same detail shown to him as being shown to the poorest uh, and weakest. And next one, please. On the left here, you can see some of those masked carnival people. Um, I hope that that person has stuffed something up his uh, jumper to look like um, carnival. Uh, and on the right, you're getting a little glimpse into the church here. You can see at the top in the white, the, the statues that have been put in the Lenten array. Underneath the statues, you can just see the priest in his uh, white surplice putting the ashes probably on people's heads as they come out. And uh, is that a collection plate by the door? Um, but not much on it. That's looking familiar too. Next uh, painting. Yes, here's the well in the centre of the painting. Uh, there they all are cutting up the fish behind the well. And there's the woman drinking some water, rather large fish, uh, to the right of her. Again, just wonderful detail, as I say, a documentary on life of the time, really. And the next. Now, this is a, um, a contemporizing of the uh, painting by Dick Jewell. And I just put it in for a bit of difference, really. But uh, he used this painting uh, uh, to place it more in, in our times. And uh, again, you can look that up. Uh, if you look up Dick Jewell's paintings, you'll, you'll find this contemporary version of it. And then if we could just go into, back to the final. There we are. Thank you. So however you're looking at this painting, horseshoe, left to right, whether it is you know them and us or whether it's actually a blending of us all, however you're looking at this painting, it is an allegorical delight. And we might do worse than, as I say, take a look at it sometime this Lent. 
It is tempting to classify each human on it as either good or bad, secular or faithful, kind or indifferent. As I was saying earlier, we love to place people into convenient cutlery trays, dividing us all up as is most useful for us. But here in this picture, you might see man against woman. Um, or, of course, is that a woman? Is Lady Lent a woman? It looks rather like a man to me uh, playing a woman. But you could see it as fat against thin, meat against fish, the profane against the spiritual, the thoughtful against the thoughtless. But what I love about this painting is that it reminds me that we are all similarly made with these endless halves. For so many of us, there's a constant fight going on between the times we are negligent and the times we are careful. Days in which we get through with a self that enjoys its own attention being centre stage and days when our self just feels a little bit more itself by not being so selfish. We have days of ritualised love, days of silent love, days of doubting love. I have an impulse to pray, I have an impulse to avoid or forget it. There are parts of me grotesquely masked and there are parts of me trying to clean my windows on a ladder, as it were, wanting to increase my transparency, my attention to the world, more me in my relationships. There are times when I want the longer view, like that man sat on the windowsill, and there are other times I, I'm so immersed in the noise of now, like the party goers on the left, that I don't see much except the pools of sick I need to avoid. Lent begins with a small dusty cross being made on my head, the hard case that protects the organ given me that makes my decisions. The season starts by asking me to imagine how life might be if that imprint of Christ's courageous compassion might make itself felt and acted on rather than just talked about or touched on in any play acting piety that tries to make us somehow more acceptable to God. Lent knows what we are like. It has seen the painting. It has read its Freud. It has read history books, political manifestos, and memoirs of hurt and achievement. Lent winces at our cyclical, self-destructive repetitions. But Lent believes in us, knowing that with God and each other, if we reach outside of our own hardened little worlds, we set the scene to be helped and maybe even changed. And that includes our religion and our faith, both of which always need conversion and amendment. That would be good for me and for those who live with me. In the Gospels, the 40 days Jesus spent in that beguiling wilderness immediately followed his baptism. Coming up out of the water, he'd heard that unmistakable voice that matters, telling him he was cherished, wanted and ready. He then goes into the heat, spending time with himself, hearing other voices that want him to live down to them. But he knows that his vocation can only be lived when he learns to live up to the one voice he heard that day in the river not living down to the ones that want him to live some conventionally indifferent, submerged existence as a consumer, a consumer of the world, instead of being a citizen of the kingdom of God. We follow him. Where he goes, so do we. A wilderness Lent is needed more than ever to do some heart repair and start becoming Christians again. Has this been a talk or a sermon? I have no idea. But perhaps in the spirit of my theme, it's both or neither. And OK, I just can't help it. There has to be a poem before I end. So here is Mary Oliver's Mysteries Yes. Truly, we live with mysteries too marvellous to be understood. 
how grass can be nourishing in the mouths of the lambs, how rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity while we ourselves dream of rising, how two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken, how people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look, and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. I hope Lent will be our time for bowing our heads. Easter, the time we will look and laugh in astonishment. I don't know who owns that Bruegel painting, but what I do know is that its themes and its scrutiny belong to all of us. Our inner landscapes match that rowdy town square. But as long as that fight continues, the soul will be alive because there are two kinds of people in the world and you ain't one of them. Mark, thank you. What a way to draw our festival of preaching to a close. That was so richly textured. And the phrase that has stayed with me from the beginning of your talk is, what is God creating in all this turmoil? Um, and maybe that's something to hang on to, that uh, amid, amid everything, uh, God is creating something. Um, we, we've gone past our time, but I, I'm sure if you're able to stay for a couple of minutes, um, of course, yeah. uh, people would, would, would love to talk. So I hope you're seeing the comments coming up there. Uh, a fountain of things to think about, indeed. Um, Elizabeth and uh, who was it? Oh, Elizabeth noticed the the, the well being at the centre, and there's a little conversation um, about that. Did it symbolise our search for the well, or um, the well being there at the centre, and that's what we need to drink from? Are we looking for the well, or um, it, is, is it there? Where do we go looking for a well this Lent? Well, of course, what I love about the painting is that uh, you might miss the well altogether because you're so focused on the fat man and the thin woman battling away and all the activity around them. You could well miss the well. <laughs> um, and of course, again, uh, that's a message in itself, isn't it? It's the, the noise of now and... Uh, as Eliot says, being distracted uh, from distraction by distraction, um, you know, we might miss the most obvious source of life for everybody in that painting. I mean, without that well, none of them would be there. Um, but, yeah. So you've um, you've prompted Tina twelve, Tina twelve, to make um, an outstanding promise. Thank you. I will try. I will be trying never to approach a sermon again with what I thought I was preparing earlier. <laughs> wow. I think she might re think about that, <laughs> rethink that in a few weeks time. Um, we've had such a feast today uh, and, and the comments are, are, are flying in. Um, Oh, it's been it, it's been great. And I like Brian Semple's uh, comment that uh, we don't carnival as much as we should. I totally agree with that. Oh, when I was uh, when yeah. I was parish priest, I uh, on Shrove Tuesday I used to have a parish party called "From Desserts to the Desert," and everybody would only bring a dessert. So we had a sugar fest, wow. uh, and you you always felt so sick on Ash Wednesday. You didn't really mind fasting. Uh, but it was a great sort of release of energy and, uh, uh, you know, carnivale, saying goodbye to meat. Yes, uh, yes. And I, I, I do think that we should, um, we should come back to some of these old uh, uh, traditions because they, they are very rooted in, in deep theology. Indeed. Do you think our, our religion has just got too wordy? 
it's a bit too wordy and it's it's quite often um uh, a little bit too shallow i think and avoid some of the richer resonance because we we feel we have to explain everything all the time and um uh, i i do think you can try and juggle access with mystery <laughs> uh, you don't have to make it difficult for difficult sake but at the end of the day we're we are engaged in in an, the adventure of faith which is an invitation into the mystery of the love of god it's it's not an ikea manual no. uh, and, jesus, and jesus didn't uh, yeah. promise us a yoga class he <laughs> promises us the cross and um and as uh, i've been hearing today through the talks you know the the understanding that follows from from pain and suffering and from amazement mm -hmm. and we need our senses and our bodies to uh, to apprehend those things yes uh, our intellects and our, or our just our ears i remember an orthodox priest teaching me that at the end of the day, God is not a subject of our knowledge, but the cause of our wonder. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we forget that at our peril, if we're endlessly trying to spell God out. And as we're doing that, have forgotten how to be amazed and in awe of the mystery of the love, mm -hmm. uh, then I think we've gone a bit skewy. <laughs> Well, I think that's a, a wonderful point at which to conclude our day. And we are all with James Rosenthal um, in lighting candles and praying for you. And, and oh, thank you. Yes. Well, um, thank you, everyone, for uh, your input today. It's been it's been great, and I I hope it's been helpful. Your comments suggest that uh, that it 